section. I want to talk about me. I was about nine when that photograph first entered our lexicon, our, our world, taken from outer space. And I grew up in New York City, heavily influenced by the civil rights movement. So I knew that there was injustice and that we had to do something about it. And then uh, Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. We had, um, at the tail, I was at the tail end of the nuclear, um, the, when we had to, like, people had to get under the, 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 their, the bomb shelters and you had to have the fallout practice. And I grew up scared of nuclear annihilation. And when I became an adult, it happens kind of quickly, all, all of a sudden you realize you're not a kid anymore. I got involved in nonviolent action, anti-nuke work. I began to work as a carpenter. And the re one of the reasons I did that was so that I could work per diem and go to demonstrations and get arrested if I had to. Or I traveled to Nicaragua and built houses. And I learned what it was like to live simply. I didn't learn that in New York, even with our fallout shelters. I learned how it was to live simply by living in poor communities in Nicaragua. And, and I loved the skills that I gained as a carpenter, and I took the fact that I could work with my hands throughout my life, understanding that we could fix things. We, we could fix things, even though I lived in a society that it's so easy to buy things. And those are things that really influenced me as I kept going. But something that always weighed on me very heavily was this feeling of a possible annihilation. And as I learned about climate change and, um, and saw, we, we saw Katrina, we saw tsunamis, there's connections when you read more. I, I started to feel more sad. And the thing that has helped me is understand how community helps with the hope, that actually we might have the solution in our hands. About a year ago, I took a course with Claudia Joseph, who's here for permaculture, to understand how permaculture as a philosophy uses nature to find solutions. And my, I, I used to say my god was nature. So I felt really connected to nature has solutions. Um, I could go on and on, but I don't want to take really time away from the speakers today who are part of a group that I joined a few months ago. We started a transitions team here in Park Slope. And that begins with a few people talking about what's going on and what we, how we might play a role. Um, basically, it's the feeling of community that I get when I'm with people that gives me hope. And so I, it's really exciting to be able to declare that here amongst the community. I want to introduce uh, the four speakers today and qualify that by saying that these friends um, are presenting on transitions for the first time. This is a real embryo of an activity for the neighborhood and we hope that this is the beginning of some real growth. Um, it's a real honor to have this beautiful welcoming space be our first presentation of space. Um, my lovely girlfriend and fellow initiating group member is going to be the projector assistant, so you'll be hearing me say next uh, while we go through the slides. So without further ado, due to the consequences of economic globalization, we are now facing three major converging global crises. Next. Peak oil, global warming, and economic instability which together represent a perfect global storm, bringing it with it massive waves of change, what James Howard Kunstler, the author, has named the long emergency. This situation is unprecedented in human history. If we were facing only one of these, it would be difficult enough, but the three together introduce dynamics that have never been seen before on this planet. How do we get here, and how can we prepare our communities? Next. In the last couple hundred of years, next, Human population has exploded. This has been made possible by abundant and cheap fossil fuels. In this incredibly brief period of time, we've been busily building an entire globalized economy based on the values of bigger, faster, and more. Next. We have lost our connections with the earth, with, our living with the living creatures on whom we depend, and with each other. Some say we have even lost our connection with sacredness and with the larger universe in which we live. 
Without realizing it, our communities have lost the capacities for resilience and self-reliance historically necessary to provide the essentials of life. And in the process, we have been losing community itself, our most precious and most endangered resource. This is all part of the cost of the industrial growth economy. But the process of economic globalization will not continue for much longer. We're now witnessing overwhelming feedback from all over the planet that tells us that it is hitting a wall. We are learning that we need to quickly reclaim our power locally, to rebuild our capacity to meet our essential needs locally, and to learn to heal and regenerate community locally. And that's really what transition is all about. But there are some other things we need to know at this moment in history that will inform how we can prepare ourselves and prepare our communities for a future that will be very much unlike the past. Next. First, we must know that the age of cheap fossil fuels is rapidly coming to an end. Of the three main global crises of the long emergency, the oil situation is probably the least understood, so I want to spend a little time talking about this right up front. Understanding peak oil is critical to understanding the path forward for our communities. Because our entire global economy is based on abundant supply of inexpensive oil, and because we've abandoned the knowledge and capacities that we possessed in the era before cheap oil, and because our governments are not yet preparing for peak oil, we're in for some pretty dramatic and uncomfortable surprises. Next. There's a lot of misunderstanding about all this, especially in this country. Because following our national oil production peak in 1970, the U.S. was able to compensate and continue economic growth by importing more oil from other countries. We have come to expect that we'll always be able to get more from somewhere else. But once we've reached global oil production peak, the world will not be able to compensate by importing more oil from other planets. This will come as a rude shock for many people's, to many people's assumptions. Next. There are, 98, there are now 98 oil producing nations in the world. Nine. Next. And at least 64 of them have already reached their peak in oil production or in decline. And that is fundamentally why oil prices have been rising so dramatically. Next. The dynamics at work here are fairly straightforward. Before oil can be produced, it first has to be discovered. World oil discovery peaked around 1960, so at some point oil production must also peak and go into decline. Demand, on the other hand, is projected to continue to increase, and this gap between supply and demand will quickly widen over time. We can't say with certainty when the exact moment of peak oil will be, we can't say exactly how rapid the decline in supply will be, but we can say that the balance between global supply and demand is extremely fragile. And we can say that the peaking of global oil supply is inevitable. Next. Of course, we're not in danger of running out of oil anytime soon, but from this point forward, oil will be increasingly expensive and harder to pump out of the ground. All the low-hanging fruit has already been picked. The rest is of lower quality, requires more processing, and tends to be mostly available in very harsh environments, like several miles under the bottom of the ocean, a la the BP oil disaster. Next. The Hirsch Report, prepared by the U.S. Department of Energy in 2005, says the world has never faced a problem like this. Without massive mitigation, the problem will be pervasive and will not be temporary. Previous energy transitions were gradual and evolutionary. Oil peaking will be abrupt and revolutionary. But what about alternatives, you might ask? Certainly, there will be many alternatives to oil, and we will need all of them. But they are not likely to come on stream quickly enough or at large enough scale to maintain our current way of life. Next. What would it take to replace oil? Scientists at Stanford Research Institute recently noticed that the 84 million barrels of oil we're burning every day to run the world adds up to about one cubic mile of oil per year. That's the Eiffel Tower in the lower right corner for perspective. What would it take to replace all this energy? Next. We need to build four Three Gorges Dam equivalents a year for 50 years to finally produce that much energy in a single year or 52 nuclear power plants a year for 50 years, or 91 million solar panels a year for 50 years. However, in 50 years with population growth, our energy needs would have greatly increased. Yes, we're certainly going to need all the alternative energy sources we can develop, but we need to know that they're simply not going to be available to us quickly enough or at the scale necessary to maintain our current way of life. This is a reality we're going to have to come to terms with. In any case, peak oil is but the first global crisis that we will experience in our lifetimes. Next. The second global crisis is global climate change. Because of our profligate burning of fossil fuels, we have pumped such a huge quantity of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that it has kicked in the greenhouse effect. 
We're now just beginning to understand that because of this, we're pretty much unavoidably on track to experience at least a 6.3 degree Fahrenheit increase in global temperature by the end of this century. Next. The third great global crisis inevitably is economic, and we've all been feeling it already. In international circles, for some time now, we've been hearing rumblings that the dollar is on the verge of collapse. Well, of course it is, because the U.S. economy is based on cheap fossil fuel, and the dollar is based on faith and trust, and backed by nothing else. And the entire global economy is based on the U.S. dollar. The whole system is now tottering. Faith and trust have been broken. Next. Colin Campbell, founder of the Association for the Study of Peak Oil, said a few years ago, the second half of the oil age now dawns and will be marked by the decline of oil and all that depends on it, including financial capital. It heralds the collapse of the present financial system and the related political structures. I am speaking of a second Great Depression, and this time it will be global. Campbell's view can already be seen as quite prophetic. Part of what this means, of course, is that there will be no economic recovery, or if there is a partial recovery, it will be very brief. We are facing a long-term economic decline which will likely be punctuated by periods of turmoil. Next. Our economic growth is based on borrowing from the future. As we've been learning from the world of finance, this isn't a very sound or sustainable policy. And now we're beginning to experience a profound rate adjustment on this debt that is basically going to put a lot of folks out of business and a lot of countries with them. A lot of notes are being called due and we're going to have a hard time paying. What we're learning is that the entire global economic system on which we have come to depend over the last several decades is profoundly unsustainable. And by definition, unsustainable, by the way, means it cannot and will not continue. Next. The point of all this is to say that we are facing a very tra challenging transition ahead, and we must make sure that we do not minimize or underestimate how challenging it's going to be. We must be thorough in our preparation, and we must take great care to strengthen ourselves and our communities physically, economically, psychologically, spiritually, so that we may actually be of service in the difficult times ahead. But this is not all bad news. This is not about gloom and doom or bunkering down and buying gold and guns. What we're witnessing and what we're engaged in here is simply the moment in the life of an intelligent species in which it has reached the end of species adolescence and must make the transition to adulthood. This is very good news, for it means that humanity is not doomed or fatally flawed or a failure. Far from it, we must simply grow up together. The bad news, of course, is that in our adolescence, we've made some serious mistakes, and part of our growing up together will be responding to the consequences of our errors. We have messes to clean up, damage to repair, debts to repay, relationships to rebuild, and wounds to heal. A profound course correction is in order, and once we fully realize the nature of our predicament, the way forward will become clear enough, and we will find the courage and determination to rise to the occasion. Next. As Paul Hawkins says, if you look at the science about what is happening on Earth and aren't pessimistic, you don't understand the data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore this Earth and the lives of the poor and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. <laughs> How does this all happen next? How can communities actually make this transition? Well, Margaret, Lily, and Helen are going to tell you the story of transition, of the transition movement, and how people all over the world are using this model to build communities that are more local, resilient, and self-reliant. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Woo, take a deep breath. That's pretty intense, I think. Um, so my name is Margaret, I live in Brooklyn, and I discovered the transition movement about four years ago. <clears throat> and ever since then, I've been wanting to start one here in Brooklyn. So finally it's happening. And believe me, I didn't know what transition meant, I didn't know what peak oil meant, and I didn't know what permaculture meant. And it was all like, what, what are these things, you know? But, um, but what I loved about transition is that it addressed everything and addresses this stuff from the head, the heart, and the hands. So the head, we've got to know these facts and we have to know the state of our world. And then we have to think about, well, how did we get here? And, and the heart means we've got to feel, we've got to feel the sadness about 
what we've done to the earth and how we've been living our lives. We've got to me the heart meant that this was addressing our addiction to oil and to stuff and to a, and to just having things and running around and trying to fill up our hearts with things and speed. The transition movement addresses this addiction and they look into how people change and of course one of the ways people change is by helping them have something else. And the hands part to me represents that because transition is about getting communities, local communities, to do things together that they think they need in order to be resilient. <laughs> you know, to me, I've been very lonely. I live alone, I do a lot of stuff alone, and I need community, and that's what the transition movement also does. It gives you hope about, we don't have to do all this alone. We can create something great. Okay, so, next. I also have to do this thing with the slides. So here's, um, and I, this is like the idea of that big peak. So we've gone up and discovered oil and there's a whole bunch and now supposedly we have reached the peak. So we've been like climbing the mountain and getting cars and all this stuff and traveling and you know, five TVs and at any rate, next. So that's the Rob, Ho that's a picture of it. Now Rob Hopkins, who is the originator of the transition movement, who is brilliant, he was a permaculture and a, um, I think he was a furniture builder, but he was teaching a class of permaculture, I'm telling you now a little history, of um, what, he was teaching permaculture in Ireland to college students, and at the same time, so permaculture is, how systems work in a natural way, like the forest. The forest, you're not, nobody's planting the forest, nobody's watering the forest, nobody's raking the forest, but the forest provides food and shelter and it degrades and it gives itself, it nurtures itself. So the idea was, well, wait a minute, um, how can we start having an agriculture that's more like that instead of just growing one crop at a time and creating all this waste. So that's where the term permanent cult agriculture came from. It has now spread to become how can we design systems that are resilient, sustainable, do not create waste, that serve everyone in a natural way, mimicking nature. Anyway, so Rob Hopkins, started the transition movement. It actually started by accident um, because once he discovered also that peak oil, uh, the concept of peak oil, he asked this class to come up with a plan for their town to descend in the amount of energy they will need by 2030. So they created this energy descent, wait, what is it called? Energy descent plan. Yeah, energy descent plan. And anyway, the town council adopted that plan and they are now using it. So that's why I'm saying transition just sort of happened. Okay, now, the other thing that he thought of was that peak of oil production and how we used it, we could turn it upside down and look at it like this. That diver, we dove into this lagoon of oil and now we're into the sandy part and the dirty part and the stuff we have to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And we're doing it in order to get the treasure at the bottom. And the treasure is happiness or whatever. But actually, we can't see each other. We can't see where we're going. We can't breathe. And so then you look up and there's sun and there's trees. So now, we're, now the whole idea is we're swimming up. We're not going down anymore. It's not gloom and doom. There's sunlight, trees, animals, people at the top, and that's, that's actually the transition idea. Next. So here's some of the underpinnings of the principles of transition, the permaculture design, which we already mentioned briefly. Positive visioning is one of the biggest things. It's really getting people together to look into the future from a positive place, not to think, oh my God, how am I gonna live without whatever I have now? Hey, we'll figure it out, we're gonna do it together and it's gonna be more fun. Inner and outer transition, we're gonna deal with how we got here, our feelings, our despair, our joy. It's not ignoring that and that's what I like about it. The thing about denial in here, we are in denial, a lot of us. The government is in denial of what's happening and so we have to do something about it locally because they're not, so let's start. Um, next slide. 
Inclusion and openness, this is part of the model. Everybody, we need everybody. We need older people, younger people. We need business people. We need gardeners and hippies and, you know, and we need to talk to each other. And that's a lot of what this is about, getting people to connect. Awareness raising, something like we're doing now. This is a big part of the transition initiating group to get people to understand where we are especially about economic growth. We can't just keep doing what we're doing. And it's all to build resilience for each community. It's going to look different, whatever we need. Uh, resilience means helping, uh, allowing a system to withstand shock and continue to function in a good way. And, um, and then to come up with appropriate solutions, not just changing light bulbs or getting the government to do something, but all the in-between things that can be done. And it's joyful, hopeful, and it spreads like wildflower. Fire. And flowers. OK. <laughs> Next slide. OK, so let's see, where are we? OK, I'm just going to read this. This is underpinning, and it's a, this is what the model recognizes, that peak oil, climate change, and the economic crisis require urgent action. Adaptation to a world with less oil is inevitable. It is better to plan and be prepared than to be taken by surprise. Next slide. Industrial society has lost the resilience to be able to cope with shocks to its systems. We have to act together and we have to act now. We must negotiate our way down from the peak using all our skill, ingenuity, and intelligence. And next slide, using our creativity and cooperation to unleash the collective genius within our local communities will lead to a more <coughs> abundant, connected, and healthier future for all and for the animals and the plants. Um, and that's pretty much the end of my talk. And I did want to mention that somebody said something about streets. The transition model includes this new thing called transition streets, where you get your neighbors together, you start having dinner with them, and then you start talking stuff. A lot of this is about working with people first and getting to know people and having fun, and then you start building projects and things. Thank you very much. But Margaret and, and Jeff spoke, I think we could say, about the head and the heart. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about maybe the hands, about practically the nuts and bolts. How does this work? So we have these sort of scary and, and depressing ideas, and then we have these uplifting um, philosophies that are guiding the transition movement. So how does it actually um, sort of take root? Um, so we, we are taking our model mostly from the transition model created by Rob Hopkins and the team in England, um, which has spread now around the globe. There's like thousands um, of initiatives. So I'm just going to go through a little bit um, the outline of how it works. It begins with an initiating group, which um, puts on what's called a great unleashing, out of which come working groups, um, which hopefully, and then as those continue, hopefully an energy descent plan is created. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those elements. Um, so the initiating group is the first one, and that's us. We, we are part of that in, um, in South Brooklyn. So there's 11 of us. We began in January in Margaret's living room. And um, we've, we've been just getting to know each other and getting to know these thing, the, you know, everything about what we're telling you. Um, we, we like to consider that we have, well, let me say what we are is, is a catalyst and, um, and a facilitator. That, that's how we consider ourselves. What we aren't are the people who are going to enact these practical projects, right? We, we want that to come from, from everyone, from the community. Um, so the way we sort of go about this, we have three tasks. And one of those is awareness raising. And that's what we're here doing today. So part of awareness raising is, is talking about peak oil. And part of it is talking about transition and, and what things can be. Um, the second part of what of what our role is is awareness is 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 connecting with what's already there, and we all know everyone who's here probably knows a, a whole handful of amazing groups already that are doing work in this direction, um, and we'll, I'll talk more about this in a moment. But 
um, what we what we consider our role is is to work around that and with that um, rather than to over overlap or overstep. So we really want to start making connections. Um, that's part of our role. And then our our final um, what I think of as our sort of ultimate goal is to do this great unleashing, which is what which is a term that we borrow from the original group. Um, and the great unleashing is is several things. It's a it's first and foremost it's a celebration of what what is here already, like I was saying. Um, but secondly, it's a series of events and um, of events that work to help the community to vision and to plan. Um, and we what we're working on right now is is how how these can come about. And the most important, one of the most important things about them is that we, we really want to use creative facilitation techniques. That's a lot of what it's about. So that it's fun and so that it's creative. Um, and just a, a quick rundown, you know, there, there's, there's types of events like an open space event where a huge group of the community gathers and topics are, are suggested and people go around. There's community visioning events where people, where there's a, a future date set and everyone can dream about what they would love the community to look like in that time and then work backwards. What we hope to have happen is for working groups to form out of these events in and around what already exists. And so that might mean um, someone who wants to bridge the gap, maybe someone who wants to um, connect the dots between a bunch of projects that are already there but we don't have anyone who's, who's having them talk, and maybe a group will form to do that. Um, it might be a, a specific project, an innovative idea that someone hadn't thought of until they visioned, and then suddenly a group is doing an entrepreneurial compost business that's come out of, of, one, of, these, of one of these events. And in addition to that, we, we do hope that, um, we hope to initiate in some way an energy descent plan, as we've mentioned. Um, similar to how the Rob Hopkins first did it in Ireland, which would be a more um, a, a document more more than groups saying what could what could life be like, for example, in 2030, and trying to work backward in a in a in a policy way. Um. I'm from Park Slope. I grew up in this neighborhood. Um, I spent most of my younger life in school, as so many of us did, and. By the time I got to the end of college, I realized that I knew a whole lot, you know, about a lot of things, you know, art and literature and English and math and so on. Um, and I knew very little about the basics of survival, about the processes that keep me alive. And so I went off for about six years and I lived on homesteads and farms in other parts of the country and, you know, got involved in farming and natural building and natural healing and outhouse digging and what have you. And when I came back to Brooklyn, after these six years away, I brought some understandings with me. One of those was the experience of living in a community, a, you know, a small community, about you know, 60 people or so, where I, I knew everyone around me on whom I depended for what I needed to live, you know, for building and, and farming and so on. And that, that experience made me understand that that's possible. Um, and that life is a lot more fun that way when you, you, you live with the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Um, life is so much richer when we reconnect to this vast web of relationships and other creatures that support our lives. I see the end of the age of cheap oil as a opportunity. The problem is the end of oil and the opportunity is to, is to create extravagantly <laughs> better lives. Um, through reconnecting with each other, we need each other, you know, to do these things we can't do ourselves, and through reconnecting to this web of life. And fortunately, opportunities are everywhere, um, right here in Brooklyn. Um, you know, one thing that I love to think about because I'm totally into compost is food waste. And right now, food waste is a problem. It causes truck traffic and pollution and methane emissions and, and, and waste. Well, what about in a transition in a transition Brooklyn, each apartment building has a designated composter. You know, and the person in the garden department collects all the food waste from their neighbors and you know turns it into arugula. And you know, and, and, and then you know in, in that model, you go from the yields being pollution, methane, et cetera, 
to the yields being food and fertility and learning and relationships. Everyone in that apartment building has to talk to each other because they have to communicate about this thing. And so that's, that's one example. Um, and, and that's how we get from the old black gold of oil to the new black gold of compost, of soil, which is the, the form of black gold that we really cannot do without. And I would just like to end with a, a, couple, a mentions of a couple of events that are coming up here in Brooklyn that totally tie into what we're talking about. Um, one is May 12th at Brooklyn Tech. It's the Brooklyn Food Conference, but I'm by the Brooklyn Food Coalition, and it's all about food justice and the, the, the foodscape in Brooklyn, how to make it more resilient. And the other thing, um, next weekend, Earth Day weekend, um, April 21st at the Old Stone House right here in Park Slope, the sixth annual seed celebration is happening, um, put on by Claudia Joseph, who's in the audience, and helped out by the Park Slope Permaculture Guild. And that's about reclaiming our seed heritage, which is another vital part of becoming resilient. So we hope you guys will take advantage of those opportunities. And we'd love to talk to you later and hear about what you're involved in and what you know about that goes along with, with this idea. Thank you. Oh, the pressure of so much good information and such a wonderful audience and, and community is that we don't have time for Q&A. What I want to do is just have a moment. Everyone in the Transitions Initiating Group, raise your hand. Because in this room are six or seven of us. And when we're done today, there will be lunch with the bunch and people can circulate. We'll, I think we all are staying for um, uh, Awakening the Dreamer workshop also so we can talk more. The notion of reskilling wasn't uh, drilled in. And it's one of my passions, again, as a carpenter, that it's learning the old skills that our communities had before we were so heavily dependent on oil is part of the fun and the solution. Um, thank you, everybody. I think that was a really great presentation and, and full. And actually, because, um, because it was our first time, everybody had different things to, to share. And we all, I think, see we need more time to, to share this information. And we will find that. And hopefully, here at the Society, we may decide that this would be a place where we could host more of these conversations. And we certainly have the facility and the, and the uh, gravitas to do that. So we'll move into that. What I'd like to do is, and, and the garden for composting. Fun.